Hey, how's it going, my friends? So, we're back with that Can It Me No essay. I mean, book on politics. It's like political theory. So, let's just continue. And the picture you're seeing right now is a Treaty of Westphalia. And the main idea Minoc is arguing for is that Europe went from localism to the centralized modern state. And this treaty was between France and the Holy Roman Empire, and France gain, gained territory, Sweden gained territory, and then uh, there w was peace at the Holy Roman Empire, and we're going to explore more of that, but I'm just going to go and read you guys the details. So most likely a modern state took hold in the 16th century. At that time, most important thing for people was eternal salvation, thereby politics follow religion, and this is a theme that Minok's going to touch, that it seems religion was really important at that time. There were Catholics and Lutherans who were competing with each other. So Luther's rebellion against the Catholic Church ushered an era of friction between Protestants and Catholics. The former was accused of being heretics, while the latter was accused of following the Pope and his superstitions. So, yeah, like, cat. I'm really, really interested in this stuff. So, Catholics were, uh, fought Protestants were her her heretics, uh, because they weren't following the Pope's word, while Protestants thought that Pope was corrupt. That was the main disagreement. And, uh, the first sector was known as Association of Believers thereby knowing how important, showing how important religious belief was to society. Most of society was religious, so back in the day, the balance of power, we've talked about this in previous chapters, was business, government, and the private sphere. And the private sphere was association, was called association of believers since people had like very deep religious beliefs. Well, nowadays that private sphere is a home or family or other kind of beliefs. Centralized monarchs acquire the concrete power of sovereignty. And this concept of sovereignty, I think it comes from a French word that probably comes from a Latin word, but it's very important and it's the idea of a ruler. So I'm still not sure what's the difference between a sovereign, sovereign um, despot, a tyrant. So it's not really that clear, but at the same time, the concept of rights started flourishing for different cl classes, and we've seen that usually those rights start with the upper class and then go down all the way to the masses. And what he's saying is that rights became more important in that era. All those who had noble blood could ascend to the throne. More people feared those who were Catholic, and this is particularly in England. Uh, the idea that people of noble blood could just ascend to the throne, and Charles I and his son were sort of Catholic, the monarchs, so there was that fear that people could just take over, you know, especially in like England where most people were Protestant. Getting involved in early modern politics was a high risk move. So this is something that has been touched upon and I was most surprised. It seemed regicide, the killing of kings was more widespread back in the day. Nowadays, that's not practice. People would just be taken out of power. Well, back then, people would just be killed off. You know, it, it was a much more violent society in that way. So, civic republics emerged first at Italy, and these republics were ruled by tyrants who solved issues through unchecked power. Civic republics were that way since they had been appointed by God. So I'm not sure if it's civic republics, but it just means like city republics. So he's saying, Minoc saying that at first in Italy there were small republics and a tyrant could rise up as a ruler of the city and he, his unchecked power could just make things happen for him. So however, Signore, and this is another quest, it means Sir, who ruled over the new republics was worried about their power. So people no longer saw rulers as appointed by God. Instead, they wanted to dispose of the rulers if they saw them being corrupt. 
so that Signore had to be clever, and he was in a constant state of paranoia. Or I, I, there's another term, neurosis, but I'm not 100% sure what it means, so I don't want to use it, but he was worried that he could lose his power. So the new skill of keeping power was the art of the state, whose whole focus was on keeping power and had to rely, rely on cynical tactics. So this is a whole Machiavellism, the idea that the art of the state, it's all about power, And keeping one's power over a city. So the focus went from being concerned with justice to being concerned with maintaining one's power of a ruler. So this was a shift because before in the Roman times, people were more interested in justice as opposed to power. The new ruler saw themselves as princes hell-bent on maintaining a power by skillfully managing their subjects. And I think there's a sophistication in this art because before it seems like people just accepted the rule or the rules of the sovereign, but now you have to be clever on how you deal with your subjects. The new politics were seen as a form of realism, as Machiavelli puts it, or as a form of corruption near times. As I noticed, there's always going to be very idealist people and they're always going to see everything as corrupt or degenerate. But some people would just think it's realist. Machiavelli said it. And then, uh, are we going to study German history? I'm not sure. But Bismarck talks a lot about realpolitik. And I'm a big Bismarck fan. So we'll, I feel like I'll try to include it. And if at some point in the future we'll end up studying that, I'll, I'll touch on a lot of that realpolitik. Cicero's standard vision of politics, so Cicero was a Roman ruler. The main concern was with justice and cultivating virtue in its subjects. This would be called a classical republic. And when we see the Renaissance, and I think much more in the Enlightenment, people want to go back to that classical republic model, or at least their idealized version of that. So the view of the classical republic was maintained in philosophical writings and enlightenment thinkers. Like I've been saying, telling you guys, rejected monarchical rule in favor of classical republic vision of the state. And, and a lot of enlightenment thinkers, particularly in France, in the Lumiere period, like they're going to argue against uh, monarchical France in favor of this classical republic vision of the state. And I'm not 100% sure. If France eventually became a republic, I think it did, and the United States as well. But once we talk about Edmund Burke, which we will 100% talk about, because I'm really interested in his ideas, we'll definitely be talking a lot about these ideas and topics. So, monarchy was seen as wasteful, warlike, and exploitative. Hobbes disagree, however. So, it seems monarchy had lost a lot of prestige, and it's, it's surprising that monarchy and Catholicism went hand in hand, because they both appear to promote this idea of luxury and it, it's very interesting that monarchy was also falling along that line of thought or was criticized because it was wasteful in a way that's a very interesting idea and look now at britain england like they still have monarchy and they also have the anglican church which is much more catholic than say a low church like some Protestant motivations that they have in other places. So, what caused civil wars, religion, dissension, aristocratic ambition, and individuality where disagreement could lead to conflict? So, guys, again, topic of civil wars, very complex. Like, we're not doing it justice here because it's just a overview, but we're going to be talking about it much more. So, why did republics collapse? Diversity of opinion, city states were too weak to be governed. So again, guys, here with Minok, he's just trying to cover such a wide amount of content that, look, he's touching on civil wars, now he's talking about republics, and I'm not sure if he's talking about republics in the Italian sense of having like a small principality that you rule, but he's saying that there was a core problem where the city-states were too big and people just, like, they had their own opinions, and this is the idea as well of the rights and the cultivated self quote-unquote, in a way, it's just a word I'm using, but the idea that people were more involved in religion, 
in politics, maybe due to the printing press, but I can't 100% say it's because of that. So what is the concept of sovereign? It's a concept was developed by Hobbes and French philosopher uh, Jean Baudin. Uh, there had to be an authority to ensure an agreement that was needed for peaceful existence. And this is something that is touched upon by Minoc a lot, and a lot of libertarian people think this. So the idea that the state is only there to keep the peace between individuals and everything else is up for grabs. And I think it's Hobbes or Locke. Honestly, most likely Hobbes who said life used to be brutish, short, wild, the state of nature. Like I, I, I think that's those are his ideas. I can't one hundred percent say it, but most likely it is. So freedom means living under the law. Laws need to be made before people can have freedom. And this idea that what we mean by freedom is freedom under the law. Hopefully, people had to be ruled by law as no rulers. That's a smart insight, by the way. And I don't know if it was Hobbes or Locke or other people who developed that concept of natural law, but it, it was the ideas are floating around at this time. So you needed a sovereign to ensure that there's no aggression. Liberal abuses the state as only providing civil order. Well, a second view, and most liberal view is probably what is seen as libertarians or even modern conservatives. Well, a second view is to view the state as something repressive and needs to be humanized and this is definitely the more Marxist view, the second view. Marxist anarchist view. What I learned, there was a shift from medieval localism to a centralized modern state, particularly during the English Civil War and the German 30 Years War. And here in the Treaty of Westphalia, it's at the end of the German War, 30 Years War. And and if we end up talking about Westphalia, guys, I'll, I'll give you exactly like all the combatants and everything, but it's just our review, so no need to go on so many details. There was also a fear of despotism. If a single ruler would become a despot, so people want to centralize the power under one ruler and court. And he talks a lot about the courts at first, but then he drops it. But the idea is that nobility had to become educated to become counselors to the rulers. And most likely this ruler was a king. Pamphlets and broadsheets uh, brought the common people into politics to an extent. I think this is my addition, but it's it's where things are going. And the difference between early modern politics and late modern politics, it is now that people see rulers and people they rule as in agreement. But before it wasn't a way. And I think this is a very important point. One of the most important developments is the idea that people and rulers are hand in hand. Like people vote for rulers because they want the rulers to apply their vision of the state. Well, before, the rulers had their own agenda and people distrust them. Rulers cannot be completely transparent as people who they rule could mean understand and punishment, expedience, concerns about what is opportune. So then he goes on another tangent on expedience. And this, again, it's very complex, guys. Like, um, But it seems people want things done and they want a ruler who gets them done, you know, but now we have that sensibility, but before they're still trying to figure things out. And the goal is to remove the gulf between a ruler and a rule. And this is something that it's also very, not complex, but it's not as clear in Minoc's book. What is he trying to say? You know, like, what does he mean by ruler and rule? In the extent that I feel like we already solved that problem, but when Minoc writes, he makes it seem as we haven't solved that problem. So ancient Greek and Rome, this was accomplished with public spiritness. Again, another concept introduced. Uh, in medieval society, there was a moral relationship. This meant that king ruled over his counselors and the counselors over the common people. Moreover, in medieval politics, policy was primarily concerned between king and other rulers of other territories. In principle, he didn't care about their subjects. So what we're seeing is medieval politics is ruler against ruler. And you guys might think about like the Norman period and how I find it, the Platon John, uh, it seemed like they were all just fighting each other, like the Norman royals against the French royals. Uh, it's very interesting. What happens, guys, and I'm, we're running out of time, but like, What's going on, guys, is there's so many concepts in this chapter, so there's just too much. 
but like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you next video where we'll talk about the next chapter.